I'd like to introduce Jeff Taylor. Jeff's going to run us through this uh, process of what is the business case for change. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I've actually been looking forward to this for a long time. And a while back when Courtney was putting the, or we were all putting the agenda together, she said to me, I'm going last. I get to be the closer. And I said, I don't want to be the closer. I want to go first. And, uh, and David then looked at me and he says, uh, Jeff, he says, I go first. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then we're paying this national speaker to come in to, by the name of Dr. Nash, and he'll go second. And we're paying him, and we're not paying you extra to come to work on Saturday, so you're going on Saturday. But I did, I was able to use some of my influence, and I've got earlier on the, the agenda here today. Um, I've had all my slides approved by Christy and others. We do that today in this uh, environment. I've got about uh, 25 slides or so, and it take about 35 minutes to get through it. This first slide is a picture of me when I was three or four years old with my older brother. Um, back then, they kind of painted the, the, the pictures. I don't know why they did that, but I kind of had, my freckles were actually would have made me a little more handsome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's my older brother. I'm in the middle of, of uh, three, uh, three boys. Uh, my younger brother was not born yet. I was my older brother. He's always been a special child. In fact, he was born January 1st of 1959 at St. Luke's. My mother says that he was the, the uh, second one born that year, so I'm not sure what she got. She probably got a basket of cloth diapers or something. Maybe the first one got uh, technology advanced huggies or something like that. I'm not sure. Um, but my older brother, he's a material science engineer. Uh, he's worked in the healthcare field, worked for Dr. Jarvik, me the artificial heart. Uh, he's done quite well. In fact, he retired uh, a while back. And my father called me the other day, and he says, why aren't you retired? He said, I need somebody to play golf with. And, and I says, well, I'm not sure. Maybe I need a bigger job. And, uh, and it also, but I also said, I really like what I'm doing, and I don't really want to retire. We got a lot of work to do here at St. Luke's, and I'm one to do it. Uh, would like to be doing it. My mother used to accuse me of being a uh, daydreamer. I'd wander off all the time, and so I'd always be daydreaming. And you know, who would have thought? You know, I could have been thinking this back then. Uh, Fifty years from now, I'd be in front of all of you talking about the transformation of of St. Luke's. Um, you know, I was talking to her the other day, and, and, and we talked about this, this trait I had of being a daydreamer, and I said, well, Mom, I, I trans I've transitioned that to, now I call it strategic thinking. <laughs> okay? I said, that pays a little better than, than uh, daydreaming. And so that's what I, that's what I try to do. So you're going to hear a lot about that today because uh, I do have a lot of thoughts about how we should organize ourselves uh, going forward. And uh, I th quite frankly, I think we're doing a, a pretty good job of that. When I think of my, uh, oh, this, this would have been a bill that my father, mother and father would have got of being a patient in the cost of a delivery back then, $115. I asked Jeff Swanson the other day what his bill was he said he remembers it, and I think Jeff, what did you say? $156. My dad said he specifically remembers my elder brothers. It was $125, $75 for the for the facility, and $50 for the physician. And you know, it was much easier for him to pay it because at that time it was only 5.2 percent of GDP. And if you take that $100, $100 and translate it to today's dollars, it's around you know, $1,500, $2,000 or something. So we wouldn't be having the problem that we're having if we could still have health care at this, at this level. So I think we need to think about that. So when I think of my role, it really comes down to stewardship. And I think of stewardship from an internal perspective as well as an external perspective. 
And from an external perspective, or excuse me, an internal perspective, we have things like our bond rating that sort of measure how we're doing, what's our financial strength or health of the organization. You look at things like our cash balance, our debt position, our age of our plant, uh, our ability to earn, our earnings power, if you will. Uh, all those things in combination create your rating. From an external perspective, I think the, the measure that we need to be focused on into the future is what is the cost on a per capita basis for healthcare. Not the individual charge of an item, but when you aggregate all of that, what is the per member per month cost? And we need to be held accountable for that. So it's taking accountability at a population level for the cost of healthcare. And that's what we're trying to organize ourselves to do. So when you look at it from an internal perspective, we have an A rating as an organization. So our bond rating is A. And you may think, well, that's pretty good. But when you look at the distribution of ratings across the country, uh, A rated organization for a health system, I would argue is on the lower end of the curve. And so our financial strength relative to other health systems, even though we're strong, we're not as strong as we, we otherwise could be. And to enter into this journey that we're talking about, given our financial health or our financial strength, we're going to need partners to, to help us with that. Is, uh, is Ed Dahlberg in the audience this morning? Yeah. So we should. I don't see him yet, but you know our our uh, decision to become a, a system and the board sort of uh, foresight back in the early 2000s when we started to become a system that was a really good decision, and it's indicated in that chart because it takes a much larger organization, and you're going to see this continue to. To, to shift where the standalone facilities will continue to shift to the, to the right in that chart and the systems will be sort of the, the ones that are able to sort of finance or uh, work in healthcare in the future. There's only three or four AA plus, there's no AAA organizations in the country, healthcare organizations. There's three or four double, um, double A plus in the country, and three of them happen to be uh, these organizations right here. ANOVA is an uh, organization that has about $2.4 billion in, in revenue. We're, we're $1.6 billion this year in terms of total size. ANOVA is $2.4. Uh, Northwestern Memorial Hospital is in an affluent area in Chicago. Uh, they have about $1.6 billion. Intermountain Healthcare, all of you know. Uh, they have 3.3 billion in revenue from delivery system operations and about another billion and a half or so from their insurance uh, operations, so they're total about 5 billion. Those organizations, ANOVA, uh, they have 570 days cash on hand. We have roughly around 140. Okay, so we have about three to four months days cash on hand. They have a year and three quarters. Um, they also have an average age of plan of around seven, seven and a half years. Or excuse me, that they don't. They have it's eleven years, so they have a lot of cash and an older plan, which they could they need to spend on it likely into the future. They also have operating margins in the range of fifteen to sixteen percent cash flow margins. We've had historical operating margins in the range of 12%. Last year, we were down a little bit in the range of, of 9.5 to 10. Northwestern, um, they have an average age of plants around seven years. They have, I think, 400 days cash on hand. A debt, what's called a debt to cap ratio, which is your debt in relationship to your equity balance, they're around 25%, which means 
um, that ratio would be, if you're at 25%, you would have one, if you had one billion in debt and three billion in, excuse me, you have one billion in debt, three billion in equity, that would give you a 25% debt to equity ratio. Our ratio today is around 42%. We're striving long term to have that ratio at 33%, at 33% but we're not there. All of these organizations, if you read their S&P report, which is kind of what I do in my spare time, because I like to look at how are they doing it? What are they doing that's different than what we're doing? And all of them will have these characteristics around outstanding governance and management, consistently strong operating margins, and strong balance sheet metrics. If you were to read our report, those top two items, that's what they would say that in our report. We've had the fact that all of you are here in this room today, you participate in our governance, which we greatly appreciate. If we didn't have that, we'd be a different organization. And we've had consistently strong operating margins, but our balance sheet is not as strong as where we would like it to be. But it was interesting, there's only one of those reports that included this statement. It happens to be Intermountain, and they're organized as a, uh, and I'm not here to sort of promote Intermountain, but if you look at the per capita cost in the Utah com community, in terms of that external stewardship perspective, they've accomplished it, and it's been recognized in their report. And so when I look into the future and think about what we need to do as an organization, that's what we need to do. We need to be delivering care at a per capita cost where people can afford it. That, that is our mission. So one measure, the exchange. I really like the exchange now that we have because it provides transparency as to where we're at. And again, as a measure from an external perspective, if you look at the exchange rates that have been published, Idaho's number nine. Okay. This is the, the average of the second tiered silver plan as compared to across the country. So we're number nine. You can see where uh, Utah, Oregon is at. The lowest one there happens to be uh, Minneapolis, or Minnesota, excuse me, Minnesota. So they've been at population management for a long time. And they, they came out with the lowest, the lowest rates. Then the other argument we get, well, Healthcare should be low in our area because wages are low. And in fact, so I went out and put together a chart on that. And here's where Idaho sits in terms of median income, household income across the country. I think we're, if you count the bars, we're around 19 or 20 in that uh, statistic. So then I looked at these in balance. So really what you'd want to have is you'd want to have high median income, and low health care cost. I mean, if we have that in this state, that's a great thing to have. That propels the economy, if you will, because health care is not a burden in, for us. And if I look at that, you know, Oregon and Utah come down even further because their income levels were higher on a median household income level. We stayed about the same. So we could do a lot better. I mean, this is what, this is our challenge. This is what we need to do from an organizational perspective. And yesterday you heard, I mean, it's a wonderful presentation that Dr. Nash gave from my perspective. I mean, he hit a lot of us just right between the eyes with some of his comments. I mean, I thought they were spot on, quite frankly, uh, and very thought provoking in terms of what we need to do to organize ourselves. And what I'd like to do is, is take a, a comparison to another, well, before we get into that. Um, if we look at our industry and what people are writing about it, this is a difficult environment that we're in. And these, these bullet points sort of illustrate that. It's a very, very challenging environment. So if you think about a strategy going forward, and continuing in the old model, I would argue this is what we're up against. 
it's just not going to work. We've got to transform ourselves into something different, but we've got to do it appropriately. So a significant conflict exists between the mission statement and the business of healthcare, between our mission statement. So, you know, when we talk about to improve the health of the people in our region and we get paid for doing things, that just doesn't work. And I'm going to correlate that to the auto repair and the auto insurance industry because I think they have a lot of similar characteristics. And if you stay with me for a minute, so we work through this, you'll begin to see some of the, some of the characteristics. The auto insurance industry is dominated or the market share is held by six or seven sort of major um, insurers across the country. And the repair industry is largely independent across, the, that's what it's historically been. In fact, I had a cousin that had a repair shop in, in Meridian, a very independent individual, and we walked in his office, the first sign you saw was a member of National Federation of Independent Businessmen. And he felt like he, and he was a craftsman in his world in terms of the repair work. Um, they used to use things like Bondo. We don't even use that anymore, I don't think. Uh, so they were thought of as craftsmen. They're very independent. And, and they had a direct connection with the consumer when they fixed their car. It was not really a direct connection in the old days to the insurance company. They'd go get their car fixed, he'd submit it to insurance, and you get it done. If you Google today auto, the auto repair business and the auto insurance business, you get a lot of fighting going on between those two environments. And one of the reasons is, is because volumes are in fact declining in the auto repair business. And why are they declining? Safety, prevention, all of some of the things, same things that we're looking at in, in healthcare. In fact, the trend, I Googled trend in auto repair business, down 1.4% last year. So if I'm an independent auto body shop, this is an industry that's kind of transforming as well. And you'll see it in that they've, they're beginning to consolidate. There's uh, repair shops or areas across the country where they're getting maybe national, national chains, if you will. So imagine this in industry getting together and saying, you know, we, we want to promote safety and reduce car, car damage and still have a business. It just doesn't work. And so that's where we're at as well. But also imagine that if you had a vertically integrated auto insurance and repair system, where if you entered into that system and you adopted the idea of prevention, you put cameras, sensors, things on your car, you agreed to have your car tracked. That's the, that technology is even out there. You could agree not to exceed the speed limit and put your phone in the car and they could track it until whether or not they do or not. So you could enter into a system that's where they reduce their risk. And that system, as a consumer, you might, want to enter, you might want to purchase from them because then in return, if they were all working together, they would in fact have the best rates, the best service, best repairs, and they'd be focused on safety and prevention. So when I think about and then compare that to healthcare, you know, our challenges are very similar. Our volumes are declining. This last summer, we saw significant volume declines. Some of us do the, the economy. Some of us do the fact that we put in electronic medical record and we were more efficient. And so we saw that, and we saw that directly hit in our bottom line. Technology uh, advances are significant, and we have a concentrated payer market. I'll show you that in a moment. Same time, we're very different in that you know, the government um, controls about half the payment stream, actually even more than that. Um, not everyone has to have a car, although my children always thought they did. <laughs> uh, and, 
And in fact, vertical integration is encouraged in our industry. In the auto insurance and, and auto repair business, vertical integration was, has been discouraged. In fact, all state in the state of Texas, and specifically in the city of Dallas, in the early 2000s, went in and bought, all, bought a whole bunch of auto body shops and said, We're gonna, they're going to become the all state body shops. The National Independent Auto Body Association filed suit against it and basically shut it down. And there's a court case on it. I mean, the government went in and, and helped them shut it down. And so they've, there's been laws in all the states where they can't vertically integrate at that level. Um, it's interesting if Geico is 100% is owned by Warren Buffett's company. He actually purchased that stock in 1951 as a, as a, uh, a student where he was in, in college, and then in 1996 bought the entire company. And last night I was looking, I, I Googled um, Geico and their repair connection. They have a very tightly aligned, very tightly aligned Geico Auto Express repair business. And if you're in that system and you need your car fixed, they've integrated the service component to that. And they're actually working very well together. I, I Googled, like, what does it take to become a member of Geico's Auto Express repair business? And they have certain standards in which they're adhering to. It's much like what we try to, uh, try to do as well, or what we're trying to do, haven't been very uh, successful at it. So here's the total US market for healthcare. This is not our market specifically, but just the total across the US. We actually have lower Medicare here and about the same Medicaid. Uh, but about you know, 65% or so is controlled by the government across the US. Uh, the commercial market, say 32%, and half of it is controlled by licensed Blue Cross and Blue Shield plans. They're not all connected as one organization, but they have this license that connects them all, which is, quite frankly, it's very powerful. And that's what's created the significant, quite frankly, significant tension in our country between healthcare and the commercial insurance environment. You know, I get the comment all the time, is like our prices are too, our, our pricing system doesn't make sense. And I'll argue, yeah, it doesn't make sense. We, uh, you know, think about, we need a, say, a 5% operating margin to, to exist. Um, and it would it'd really be nice if we could charge $100, say, $5. Everybody would pay us that $105, and we had a cost structure of $100 we'd have a 5% margin, right? We have this obligation to provide free and charity care, and let's say that's 5% of our business, and that's given away for free. So if that was the only segment that paid differently, we could charge everybody $105.5, okay? The system we have today, and you can mathematically go through this formula, and the system that we're subject to as a delivery system if we want to have a 5% margin and the Medicare system is paying us 90%, let's just assume that they're paying us 90% of our cost. So instead of paying $105, they pay $90. Medicaid, and that's probably, that's probably a pretty good number is what's happened over time. We, we need to reduce our cost structure to be at $90, but we're not there as an, as an organization. Across the country, Medicaid pays about 85 cents on the dollar. In fact, there's lawsuits that have been pushed out there that says we need to pay at least 85%. You don't have to pay more than 85%, but you gotta pay at least, states, you gotta pay at least 85%. So when you do that, you have 90% for Medicare, 85% for Medicaid, you gotta make it up somewhere else, right? 
across the country the licensed Blue Cross plans, given their market share, if you will, they've had the ability to negotiate competitive rates relative to other, other payers. And let's say they've negotiated 10%, 10 or 15% premium relative to everybody else. That means this remaining very uh, thin slice, which I can't show you there, but a very half the commercial business, they have to pay something different. And when you charge everybody the same, our standard charge structure, instead of $105, needs to be $200. So just mathematically, it has to be $200 to get to that same place. So that's what doesn't make sense. You have a cost structure that's $100, $200 is what we charge. We net it all down, we get $105. So that's what people are concerned about. So we have a system where it has, I will argue, it's limited accountability and confusion. Today, the consumers are up here. They either enter into the commercial market, Medicare market, Medicaid, or other. And then the delivery system sort of works underneath that, trying to work with contracts with everybody. And it's very confusing. This chart just kind of illustrates the confusing nature of that. So from a strategic perspective, I think vertical integration makes a lot of sense, <clears throat> but it requires collaboration and leadership, and it requires assumption of a global budget. And that's what you're gonna hear a lot about today, is we're gonna take steps necessary to take accountability for a global budget. And we want to work with all payers to do that. All payers to do that. Not just select health. Not just anybody else who wants to have a contract, but all the payers that we deal with, whether it's employers, the government, Medicaid, we think we have the ability, we need to take responsibility for a global budget. So yesterday, Dr. Werner made reference to seven elements of collaboration, what's required to sort of put this together. And I happen to be at the uh, Mindshare conference that uh, Intermountain put on, and Governor Levitt spoke to this. He used to be the head of CMS, very knowledgeable person. And he, his idea around the future is around high-performing narrow networks. And the question he raised is, who's best positioned to put these networks together? <coughs> And in different parts of the country, different organizations have been able to put it together. But it requires the, the, the effective elements of that is you need to be able to attract a population. One strategic factor of that is do you have a brand? You know, we have a brand. Blue Cross has a brand. Regions has a brand. Lots of people have brands. Okay? It's a, it's a question of who, who does the consumer want to, want to attach to? Okay. Do you have the ability to manage risk? You know, each one of those, whether it's an insurance company, delivery system, or the physicians, we all have our unique abilities in managing risk. Financing risk. Financing risk is overwhelmingly would be the uh, competency or the ability of the of the insurer market. They have the ability to finance risk. We don't have the ability to finance, to finance risk, given our balance sheet that I just showed you earlier. So I'm saying we need a partner if we're gonna finance risk. And the last thing on there is the ability to collaborate. And uh, Governor Levitt, I think he's gonna write a book about this, but it's who has a, what I'll call a collaborative IQ. The ability, who, who has the capacity, the organizational capacity and leadership to, to pull organizations together, to collaborate? Who has that IQ to be able to do that? And I would argue, selfishly from our perspective, we've demonstrated that collaborative IQ throughout our history. Not to say others can't do it, but I think we've done it 
very, very well. So here's what kind of a depiction of what I think it needs to look like. And throughout the rest of the day, in the blue box, you'll see a lot of competencies that are associated with trying to be accountable for a global budget. And I will tell you, this is hard work. We don't have the ability today, in the way we're organized, in the way we're doing things, to just immediately take accountability for a global budget. We've done it in parts of our organization, where we said we're going to take limited risk for this subset of a population. But on a large scale, today we don't have that ability. In the future, we need that ability. And we should organize ourselves to, in fact, get to that place. So the business model, it requires that we get up on the upstream and everything that we do becomes a cost. If we have certainty in payment and we attract a large population, that's the business model that we need to be in. And so you may ask, you know, why, given our industry, why, sh why should we be optimistic? And I, I heard this a while ago, I thought it was really kind of key. We have a $3.4 trillion economy in healthcare. And there's people out there that say that a, tr that a third of it is waste. And I would look at that and say that's an opportunity. Because to the extent that you can eliminate that waste and get access and certainty to a payment stream, so you have the ability to get after that waste, there's margin that's going to occur directly to to who does that. And whoever can do that faster than somebody else is going to win in the future. The rate of change to execute on this, this slide, whoever does it faster, is going to be a winner going forward. And that's a key point. I think you need, we all need, it's, it's a tough concept, but that's our competitive advantage going forward. We need to be able to do that, and we need to be able to do it quicker than anybody else. And so how does this inure to the benefit of the um, consumer? Well, they want to see lower premiums. And this is an example here where the current environment, the premium is collected. A portion of it goes to pay for administration. A portion of it is retained for, to finance risk. A portion of it is paid to all of us and people like us. And then the bottom half represents a margin. That's the way the system works today. So going forward, if we have certainty of that top line revenue, and we have an agreement around how the margin is going to be split with the insurer, and we have, can take out cost, we've taken out cost to the system, which creates a reduced cost structure in the system, which then provides for premium stabilization going forward. So we want something, again, that looks like this. And we need to attract more patients. And we also need to, and Jeff will talk about this today, St. Luke's Health System can't do this alone. We have to engage others in this journey. If we look at the spend in this market, maybe Idaho uh, healthcare economy is around $10, uh, $10 billion. In our market, maybe it's $5 billion, and we're $1.6 billion of that. So we're trying to take control of that, not, not control, we're trying, to, trying to work in that environment to create a lower, a lower amount. And so I'll argue that we have the ability, that's what we're going to talk about the rest of today, as I think we have great ability to do that. And I'm going to leave you with one. Oh, two more slides and I'm almost done. If I'm running out of time back there, I'm sorry. Um, when I think about the relationship, and this is not, I, I don't want anybody to take offense to this, to this slide. It's just the reality of where we're, where we're at. St. Luke's Health System, we brought Select Health into this market. And we're aligned in this journey, what we talked about. 
we have 100% alignment. We sit around the table and talk about how are we going to do these kinds of things. We're interested in having engagement with others to do the same thing. Because that's what we have to do because we, we work with everybody. We have to. And so we have, we're starting on this journey with, with uh, the other payers. We have a total cost of care arrangement with regions. Uh, Blue Cross is sharing data on the Medicare uh, Advantage plan. And we're, uh, we're in a risk environment, but we're 100% aligned on the business model. So there's pieces and parts, but we need all these lines to get to become green going forward. That is, in fact, our challenge. So my concluding thoughts are, you know, we, we have the ability to do this. Uh, it's not what do we have to do to survive, if you will, but what can we do to create a better system? What can we do? And, you know, I showed you a picture earlier of, of me when I was four years old. And many of you know I have three granddaughters um, that range the oldest ones, too. And the other day, one of them was at the house. And I took this picture of her, and it looks like she's practicing to be our next CFO. <laughs> uh, so maybe, maybe 50 years from now, uh, you'll see somebody else up here doing that uh, same thing. She has her glasses on backwards, but that actually shows she's actually pretty smart because that's the only way they'll stay on. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much.